Well, good morning. Morning, everybody. Stand. Uh, this is just my advice or me talking a little bit, but you know when we when we sing songs and when we are worshiping and everything, we're not doing that for each other, and we're not doing that for ourselves. And if we give this in our minds, what we're doing, we are praising God. We are worshiping God. When we're up here in the worship team and, and singing, it's not that we're singing out to everybody. Or when the specials are up here, uh, I've heard specials, you know, I heard one just the other day say, well, we're, we're singing for the people, but we're singing about God. And I said, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. We're praising God. We're worshiping God. We get worshiped with it. But God's listening, and we, if we sit there in our minds saying, hey, God's hearing my, my voice, hearing me sing, and I'm worshiping him, and he is pleased with that. So remember, when we're worshiping our songs and praising God, that's what we're doing. We're praising God. We're not doing it for each other. So with that in mind, page 54 of the Blue Books, let's just praise the Lord. Let's sing it out. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Oh, we thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your love. from above we've been sharing all the good things a family can afford let's just turn our praise to heaven and praise the Lord let's just praise the Lord praise the Lord let's just lift our hands to heaven and praise the Lord let's just praise
Let me verse is Colossians 3, 1. If he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Teachers, I do have the slips to pass out for literature today, and I need them back today. So, if you want to stand, we will be dismissed to class. And uh, Brother Terry, can you dismiss us?
All right, chapter 23 this morning of the book of Acts. Paul will make his appearance here before the Sanhedrin court. Now, if you remember last week, uh, he's gonna, he is going to appear before this mob that nearly would have killed him had not the Roman, Romans interfered. Uh, he's, he, gives, he gets a chance to speak to them, and of course he gives his testimony. Uh, and, of course, Paul, being who he was, a Pharisee, and in his zealousness to really to, to do the will of God, he persecuted uh, the Christian church. And, of course, we, you and I know that. But he wanted, he wanted these people here who were so zealous for God themselves that he knew what they felt. He, he was there one day. And, of course, <clears throat> things didn't go too well. <laughs> Of course, when you're talking to a mob that hates you, things are not going to go too well. And so, fearing for his life again, the Roman commander of the garrison here, and I, I'm going to call him, I, I saw his name someplace and could not find it again, Claudius something, but, so I'm going to call him Claudius. He's the commander here at the post at, in Jerusalem, and uh, he, he takes him from them, and then he calls a meeting. I want you to notice the last verse of chapter 22. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Now what happened in this discussions afterward when he was being interviewed or questioned or whatever by these Romans, they were, they were going to scourge him and and Paul throws out his ace card, his trump in the hole. He said, you're going to scourge a Roman citizen with no, no trial and no, nothing? No. And the, whoa, that changed things altogether. So he's going to appear back. This Claudius is a pretty shrewd man. He's going he's to bring him back before the council under guarded conditions, and he will let them examine them. Now, Claudius is only, his main concern is keeping calm in Jerusalem because the Jews were notorious about little uprisings all over the place and he had to squelch them all the time. This is a, this is a, Pas this is a feast of the Passover. But a lot of people, a lot of Jews in Jerusalem, so he didn't want anything to bust loose here. He wanted to keep control of these angry Jewish people. So he calls the meeting before the Sanhedrin and he's trying to get, he's trying to find out if they've got enough charges against him to bring any kind of, uh, you know, anything against him. And so, this, this guy knows that Paul has rights as a Roman citizen. He's going to make sure that uh, he's dealt earnestly with him. And that's where we're going to deal with this morning, chapter 23. Paul will appear before the Sanhedrin again. By the way, we'll tell you a little bit about this court. They said, they said that it's set in a semicircle, the first three rows <laughs> is where the, uh, what they called the learned, the learned men sat. And then, of course, this court was made up primarily of Sadducees. There were Pharisees in this group, very strong group of Pharisees, which 
Paul will appeal to here very wisely uh, in, in his defense. So, Sadducees, not very friendly guys. This is the aristocrats, and this is who he'll be talking to. And by the way, as soon as Paul opens his mouth, he makes the high priest mad. He makes the other people mad when he claims his innocence. <laughs> read. I'm gonna, let's read. We'll read a little here and uh, see how Paul does. Verse 1 of chapter 23. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. He's declaring his innocence, and he's declaring his conscience that is clear. Now, you say, well, how in the world could he do that? Well, I don't know if I can explain this or not, folks, but Paul was. When Paul was persecuting the Christian church, his conscience, in his conscience, he thought he was doing God, he was doing something God was pleased with. Uh, trying to stamp out this new group that had risen, this people in the way. He thought his conscience was telling him this. He, see, the problem was Paul's conscience was not under the direction or, or motivation of the Holy Spirit. So once he got converted, his God changed. His conscience became different. And, and that will happen to you, folks. When, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, your conscience changes. So what light Paul had, he done in good conscience. So we, that, that we can understand. So you say, well, so it, it, as if we look at it, when Paul said, I'm clear of all my... <laughs> this not only made Ananias mad, it made those Jews who were so mad at him that they've already tried to kill him a couple of times. They've kicked around on him and beat him and whatever. Uh... Here's what, here's, what, here's what happened here, right, right away. Now, remember, this meeting was called, this ain't an ordinary meeting. So what will happen right here very next is kind of controversial. A lot of Bible scholars have debated this over the years. Some say Paul told a lie here. But we're going to defend the Apostle Paul. Uh, this is not a normal council. The, the Roman Claudius called it. Remember, I just read that verse 2 in chapter 30. He wanted Paul back before the Sanhedrin to see what kind of evidence and see what kind of criteria they were going to throw at him. So let's read these four, a couple of verses, and we're going to see the intolerance of this council. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. One, Paul just made a statement. I'm clear. He says, I'm innocent. This Ananias was a scoundrel. I'll give you a little bit of information on him here very shortly. He, he commanded uh, Paul to be hit on the, on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by revilest thou God's high priest. Somebody spoke, some of the Pharisees here probably, stood up and said, you're, 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 you shouldn't be doing this, reviling thou God's high priest. Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now, here again, a lot of debate here, what scholars think that what happened. Some flatly say he lied here. Now, let's examine this and take a look at it. Got this, the meeting, the if this was an un, a, a different meeting called by this Claudius, the, the commander here, very well, the high priest may not have been in high priestly garb. He may not have been. And when, and in the, and, and if he, that would have been the only way Paul would have recognized him. Paul hadn't been to Jerusalem for yet, for several, for probably a good, a good while here. He probably did not know Ananias face to face. And so if he had not have been in his priestly garb, he wouldn't have known who spoke up and said, smack him, smack him, smite him on the mouth. So Paul says, Paul just replies, I, I don't know, but I can see a little aggravation in Paul's voice when Paul says, God shall smite thee. And then he called him a whited wall. Now, you know, you, you, I think you know what that expression, it speaks of a wall that, that's about to tumble down, and what do they do? They put whitewash on it to make it appear 
strong and, and upright. You remember what Jesus said to those Pharisees? And I, I'm not sure where this was at, but he, told, he called them, uh, there, he said, he, show, he expressed the, the way sepulchers were. They, they often would, would whitewash them with paint. And I think what whitewash is is just watered down paint, ain't it? I don't know. <laughs> but he called them. You know what he called them? He said, you're, you're full of dead men's bones. You're like those sepulchers out there that's whitewashed. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. That's what Jesus said about the, the priest, these people. They, they did this so they wouldn't get defiled. By stepping on an unmarked grave, uh, an unmarked place that was unclean, uh, so that gave them, let them move away from anything that was whitewashed. So this guy is rotten. <laughs> uh, indeed, <laughs> indeed he is. Uh, he is rotten to the core. So when he just speaks up, if Paul had not been looking right straight at him, he wouldn't have known who spoke up. And so he defends himself here. I, uh, he said, and of course he, he, he jumps on him right quickly. He said, how can you, you're going to sit in judgment of me, have me to be smitten before I'm found guilty of anything. He said, that, that you're going to. And so, Paul, so I think in Paul's defense here, Paul even quotes a scripture here out of uh, uh, Exodus. 22, 28, where it said that you're not, you shouldn't speak evil of, of someone God has put, put in power. Boy, if that were true today, folks, I'm, you can smite me about 10 times. I'm guilty of talking about our crooked, perverse, whitewashed politicians who on the outside, oh man, President Biden coming out all is well. The, gr the gross national thing went up, what, 2.6%? Oh, we're going, we're on the right way. To, we're moving the right direction. The only way we're going to be moving in the right direction is when these prices begin to come down and where the, uh, where, where some kind of, a, where I have said a few bad things about him. I confess that this morning. <laughs> now, he's there. God. God, God either put him there or allowed him to be there. I, I won't argue that point at all. But I guess I will answer for that one day, speaking evil of, of dignities, dignitaries. Now, Paul, Paul, in his defense here, and again, here, if Paul, if, if he didn't know, I don't think he would have flat, I don't believe he lied here. I think he was under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you a little bit about this Ananias, this, Hannah, this priest. Even the high priest of the day, the Sadducean priesthood had a bad reputation. They, they oftentimes would surround themselves with thugs, hoodlums. They would hire them to do some of their things they wanted done. They were, they were tyrants, and Ananias was known for that. We know that Ananias became the high priest AD 47, 47 AD by, of course, playing politics with the Herod. That's, that's how he got in it. Jewish historian de describes him like this. He's, the, he's one of the worst scoundrels to ever hold the office. He took, he took the tithes that belonged to the common priest. He was, he was a man of wealth and power. It is said he was not above hiring assassins and criminals to do his, his carry out his wishes. He was also a very smart politician, and he, loved, he was close to Rome. And, of course, that was his undoing. In 66 A.D., in that Jewish rebellion, he, the Jews killed him when, they, when that occurred. So, when they first captured Jesus, they took him to what they said was the high priest's house, Ananias. And then they, when they show up at the Sanhedrin, the high priest is Caiaphas, uh, who was the son-in-law of Ananias. Ananias, there was so much stink about him that... They had to put him to the side and put a front man out there, and that was his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And Caiaphas, of course, uh, pronounced a death decree on Jesus. Evidently, Caiaphas has been moved to the side here, and Ananias is taking care of this particular meeting at the Sanhedrin. Uh, 
always held to be the high priest by one group. Caiaphas generally considered to be the high priest by another group, but uh, it's the same guy who is pushing the whole thing, and that's Ananias. Paul nailed him. Paul nailed him. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Right. Right away, there's there's going to be a disruption, and I think notice what verse six says about Paul here. Uh, but when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, "Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee." Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Now, the main objection these Jews had, of course, was Paul teaching that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They didn't want to uh, assert to that. That's, that's the one thing they hated. So, Paul knew something here. He gonna get, he's going to get really the main thrust of this away from him. The, the heat of this battle, he's going to bring up this. He said, I'm a Pharisee, and he said, of the hope and resurrection of the dead. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude were divided. Of course, we know why. Here's why. The, the, for, you, you know what the Sadducees believe? For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. And, of course, they did not believe in angels, nor spirits of any kind. But the Pharisees confessed both. Now, the, my writer went on to say that this Pharisee group that was in the Sanhedrin, even though they were outnumbered, they were very outspoken, and they, they apparently had some power. So, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, <laughs> we find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now, they wouldn't up and say that Jesus spoke to him, but they said if the Pharisees were saying, if an angel or a spirit has spoken to Paul, he's in it. He's free. We see nothing wrong with it. Now, of course, the Sadducees de denied all three of them. No, uh, the resurrection, there's no, no, no such thing as angels nor spirit. So there was quite a disagreement. In other words, the heat, was was off fall for for a while, and uh, there was a. Uh, let me say something here this morning about this. A Pharisee back then could be b saved, could be converted, and continue to be a Pharisee. They had a, they had a straight understanding of the law, but a Sadducee could not be both Christian and remain a Sadducee. Because they, of course, they denied the resurrection, which is really the most important, the most important doctrinal error that they carried. And of course, denying angels—that's that in that, spirits also. So that that simply could not happen. So, O Claudius, now I believe is overseeing this meeting. He's the one who called it, and I think he was present at it. And I think he more or less he may have been the moderator for a time or two. He saw what was going on, and. Verse 10 says this, And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. So the argument grew so intense that Claudius got, got worried. You know, he, he saw this just a few days prior to this, whenever this mob, whenever they drug Paul out of the temple and attempted to get at him later on, in chapter 22, long about verses 22 and 23, they would have they would have grabbed him then, had not uh, the, the soldiers rescued him. So he took him out of here before it got too bad. And that night, or the night maybe the following night, the night following, verse 11, the Lord stood by him and said, "Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem." so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, we sit here and wonder how Paul went through nearly, what, I don't know, a little over, maybe two years, a little over two years imprisonment at Rome and the things that was going on. Uh, the, he knew the Lord was with him. He also knew 
that nothing was going to happen to him until he made his way to Rome and was going to witness there. The, you remember in Paul, in, when, when Paul first got saved, and what was the guy's name that he was supposed to go see? I want to say Ananias. And what was his name? Zechariah? No, not Zechariah. Ananias. 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 He told, he, God told him a little bit, and he really prophetically told Paul that you're going to be, you're going to be a, a missionary to the, to the Gentiles, and you're going to speak before ju judges, kings. You'll go. You'll be. You'll be standing before emperors. And sure enough, Paul is going to get that chance. He will get his shot. He'll go to Felix, and he'll go to he'll he kind of like uh, Jesus did. They they it, one not wanting to didn't know what to do with him. Shipped him off to the other one. The other one looked at him and judged him and sent him right back. But that's just, this is really good, what's going to happen to Paul. He will, he will get his shot at going to Rome and speaking to the big boys, and he will. The assurance from the Lord. The Lord stood by him the following night. Be of good cheer, Paul. <laughs> Be of good cheer. Even though the mob wants to kill you, they would too. But he said, Be of good cheer, for nothing's going to happen to you until you make it to Rome. Yep. You know, folks, I, I really think you and I are no different today. You ever you ever sit around and you're wanting to see somebody and you're quandering, well, oh, what am I going to say to him? What am I going to say to him? We need to cut out that foolish stuff. Just go, and I think the Lord will tell you what to say when you get there and we, when you begin to deal with it. Now, something strange hap pops up here in verse 12. There's a cons conspiracy formed, and I always thought this to be pretty comical. Uh, uh, I remember Brother Miller preaching on this before, and he, he always wondered if them fellows ever ate anything or ever drank any water. Even though they, they never did get Paul killed, he wondered how, wondered how long their vows lasted. There's a plot, a conspiracy is formed against Paul in verse 12, and, it, and, and when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came where? <laughs> they came to the priest. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he may bring him down unto you tomorrow as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him, and we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. Now, the plot is, these guys got together, 40, 40 right around 40, got together and vowed a vow, we'll not eat nor drink until this man's dead. This, that's the vow they made. So they, they, they get the approval of the chief priests and the elders. That's here, here to get funny how these chief priests and these elders were so meticulous on the, ma the minor things of the law, but it didn't bother them a bit to conspire to kill this great man of God, conspire to kill the Lord Jesus. These people were the w strangest people I've ever seen in my life. But, of course, that's the way most sinners are. They simply don't understand. This report... Uh, there's a plot. So you go tell Claudius, we want, we want to have another meeting with some more, inter we want to do some more interrogating with him, and when he comes down, we'll just overrun him. We'll kill him as soon as he gets near us. We'll kill him. Now you would think that these 40 men would vow to one another, this has got to be kept secret, fellas. This has got to be kept among ourselves. 
but somehow it leaked out. And we, we, we don't get much information here. Scripture doesn't tell us. Luke didn't fill much in here. But when Paul, here's verse 16, and when Paul's sister's son, that would be Paul's nephew, heard of their lying in wait. <laughs> Somebody leaked something out, and we, 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 we know nothing of Paul's sister, nothing of her son. The question may be, well, I wonder if they were believers. Well, we don't even know that. We do know one thing. This boy thought, uh, probably thought a lot of his uncle <laughs> to the point that he reported it. No, they're lying. He went and entered into the castle. First of all, he went to Paul in the prison, and he told him. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he has certain thing to tell him. So he took him, brought him to the chief captain, and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him, and prayed me to bring this young, uh, this young man unto thee, who has something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain, now I think this would be this Claudius fella, he's the chief captain of the garrison, took him by the hand, and went with him aside privately, and asked him, What is thou, is it thou hast to tell me? And he said, and he said to him, The Jews have agreed to this, to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. What scheming, really, murderers we have here. Uh, men who are willing to allow these kind of proceedings to go on in the, in, in the very fact of uh, intent to kill the Apostle Paul. Now, you remember I told you earlier on, and I found this out by, of course, reading that the, the Romans had, had allowed the Jews to execute people by, by stoning if they broke one of their laws. They, they, I guess the mob, thinking they, it's okay to beat him to death because that's what they, were, they would have done had not they, him, he, they had not rescued Paul. Of course, they did not allow them to crucify anybody. I don't know what the difference here is. Uh, uh, you're going to kill somebody, uh, diff different ways of doing it. Uh, but anyhow, I guess these 40, these 40 men wasn't using their head. Had, had this happened, <laughs> Claudius would have surely tried to rescue Paul. It would have been quite a scene. Quite a lot of things could have happened, especially if any of these Roman soldiers would have either got wounded or killed. It, it, it would have been it had been a pretty serious thing, which uh, by the way the finding out about this was uh, really fortunate for the Sanhedrin court and for these fellows who were involved in it, uh, because Rome would have re would have spoken back pretty harshly and the, and uh, uh, this uh, this Ananias of course being the chief priest was uh, was a scoundrel, but. The Roman, the Roman overseers, too, were pretty rough on the Jews also. So this plot here that was revealed was probably a good thing that it was. And so the, plan, so the young boy tells him, don't, don't yield to this. They're going to want you to bring Paul down to the council meeting. And as soon as he gets near, they have vowed to kill him. So don't do this. So the chief captain... Then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called on it. He's got a plan. He's going to get Paul the heck out of here. <laughs> He's going to get him out of here while, before anything happened. He called on him two centurions, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten, that's 70, 70 men 
which I would call cavalry men, and spearmen, 200, at the third hour of the night. He's planning on getting Paul out of here at 9 o'clock that night under the protection of 470 Roman soldiers. 200 heavily infantry. Now, I suppose the only difference in that and the 200 spearmen, perhaps these spearmen, that's all they, they were, they were called light infantry. They only carried perhaps a spear for a weapon. Now, if you've ever seen a fully, a picture of a fully armed a Roman soldier, boy, he's got the garb on. Got a, carries a big old shield. He's got a sword. He, m uh, most of them probably carried a lance of some kind also. So they were heavily infantry. 470. One guy said he really had 471. He had the, he had the Lord, the Lord uh, protecting him also, which was by far the most important one. <laughs> now, it's good to have security around you. But when you got God around you and you're in the shelter of his arm, you can't, you can't get any bet, better than that. So he, get, he gathers his forces, and here's, here's what his plan is. He's going to send him over to Caesarea, where is the, the capital of uh, where the Roman uh, main headquarters is. His providential administration was located. Felix is there, and of course there is... Uh, there's more soldiers there. The party was to leave Jerusalem about 9 o'clock that night, third hour of the night. They were to bring, I think the verse tells us, they were to bring some uh, animals, that, verse 24, and provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. Now, usually these beasts were donkeys in that day, uh, and they were beasts of burden. They carried burden, and they would have carried the Apostle Paul. Uh, of course, the infantry, all of them would be walking, of course, except for the 70 cavalry people, which would be on horses. <clears throat> Isn't Dr. Luke good? You can almost hear the hoof beats in the marching of these, uh, these uh, spearmen. Uh, he brings us right into this, to this dramatic scene. What happens to the 40 uh, guys who uh, took an oath that uh, they wouldn't enter great until they killed Paul? They had more loopholes <laughs> for, for these type of oaths and stuff that, that they took. And they would do uh, something like sacrifice a goat and pay so much money here or there, and they would be released from the oath. So we don't have to worry about them still starving. Uh, they, they got out of that pretty quick, I'm sure. <laughs> It was all just, just a racket. Yep. Just racket. I would say this was probably pretty quickly organized, and this vows that they took, of course, it was, it was nothing. I, I say Ed said they got out of it pretty quick. Uh, it probably didn't mean a thing to them. Uh, of course, uh, Felix is the Roman uh, procurator or the governor of Judea, and he will send him uh, there. And he will, of course, appeal higher up as Paul, he goes on trial. We'll have another trial next week. He's, got, he's had this hearing at Jerusalem, and then Paul will put, be put on trial again. And, of course, he will appeal to higher ups from here, and he will make his way to Rome. He will. Uh, and... I don't know that I'm getting ahead of myself, but I think in Paul's imprisonment in Rome, somewhere around two years, if I'm correct, he is he really gets a lot of privileges. They he he gets after he's there a while, he gets visitors. He's really kind of allowed to roam, move around, and uh, he does a lot of witnessing while he's there. He'll be two years in Caesarea too. Really? He's yeah. Trying to get a bribe out of him. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know that. He'd be there that long. But anyway, uh, Paul, of course, is heading uh, to his last, to, and, and I, I think he knows this. I think, I think uh, he's, and when he, he will, he, when he will write his final book to Timothy, his final saying, he declares in there that he's, he's done and he pretty well knows it. And of course, he will die there at Rome. And but 
his, the lasting effects of this great man has, never, has not died and uh, uh, did not die. Of course, he's very alive today. All right. I thought I'd be longer on this, but I, don't, I think we covered everything, didn't we? we did. Good story. Yes, sir. Beautiful. Thank you.
It's, it's on now. Yeah. It's on, yeah. I see the green light. Yep. Good morning. How are you doing? Okay. So how are you doing? I'm fine. You? How's your wife? She's doing well. Uh, does she have cancer? Yes. I'll be praying for her. Okay. They got to heal her. Right. But well, I thank you. We appreciate it. That goes to all the United States. And I'll put her on it. Okay. We well, appreciate it. Sure do. She, she'll make it. God oh, yeah. She'll make it. Oh, yeah. Think, I don't think they, I don't think they muted me. <laughs> yes, we're doing good. We're doing good. Brother Zach. Good morning. Hello, oh, you're welcome. Uh. Oh. <laughs> hey, I don't think I'm muted, am I? Thank you. 